Mr. President, Excellencies, Distinguished Members of Parliament, Ladies and Gentlemen, uh, let me start by thanking the Croatian uh, Government and Parliament, um, as well as uh, the President of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly for inviting me to be with you today. As a former parliamentarian, I always look forward to coming to your meetings. And today's meeting also gives me the opportunity to congratulate uh, Croatia on joining the European Union this summer. Uh, this is an important step uh, in the steady integration of Southeast Europe uh, within the Euro-Atlantic uh, area. The Belgrade-Pristina agreement uh, on normalization represents another significant uh, step. Implementation uh, of uh, that agreement must continue, and NATO and K4 have a key role in that implementation. Alongside uh, the European Union, uh, NATO will play its part uh, in making sure the future is a better one for all the countries of South East Europe. We will continue to assure um, peace and stability to engage uh, all interested countries in partnership and cooperation and to keep our door open for new members. Over the past decade, uh, Croatia has already walked through uh, NATO's open door, and so have Albania and uh, Slovenia. Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, and the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia all know that uh, NATO's door is open for them as well. If they demonstrate a new resolve to settle old differences, a track record of reform and responsibility, and political commitment to building security and stability together with their neighbors and with other nations. Given their recent history, the people of this region understand the value of defense and security. They understand why defense matters. The international security environment has changed dramatically. Most of our operations and missions take place a long way from home. Very few of our nations still have conscription and this has led to a certain gap between the public and the defense institutions, such as the military. At the same time, the financial crisis has placed great strains upon our economies. It has led to defense cuts in many of our countries, and it has raised questions about the need for defense. Over the past six months, NATO has been working with prominent research institutes from eight alliance member countries to look into this question. These institutes discussed defense with representatives of civil society. They also drew upon the results of public opinion polls, and some also conducted interviews with policymakers and parliamentarians, so perhaps some of you were approached as well. The goal was to, to get a broad picture of how our publics look at defense and the value they place upon it. The big question was, how much does our defense really matter? The results are now in, 
And the answer is clear. In a nutshell, defense does still matter. But we all need to do a much better job at explaining why. Four findings stand out from the research. First, there is a widespread respect for our military forces and broad support for defense investment. The level of support varies from country to country. Quite a few people believe that we can and should cut further. But many more believe that we should either maintain our current level of spending or increase it. Interestingly, uh, the same result also came out of this year's transatlantic trends uh, survey. Second, our publics do understand that a country's freedom and prosperity depend on its security. But they don't understand how much we invest, how our investment is used, and what roles our military forces actually perform. For example, many people believe that our country is spent far more on defense than we actually do. In one country, in one country, public estimates of defense investments as a percentage of gross domestic product range between two and 15 percent, 15 percent. Um, I think such views may help to explain why some people believe that more fat can still be cut from defense. The reality, of course, is very different. The fat has already been cut, and we are now very close to the bone. Now, third um, outstanding result from, from this research is that defense industries are generally viewed as positive contributors to our economies. But these views are colored by perceptions of wasteful spending, a lack of transparency, and inefficiencies in procurement. And fourth, our survey showed a growing divide between North American and European perceptions of NATO. Generally, Europeans tend to value their country's membership in the alliance. In particular, being an ally is seen as improving the transparency and effectiveness of one's national defense forces. But North Americans increasingly believe that NATO doesn't offer much for their security and that Europeans need to share more of the transatlantic security burden. So, in light of these findings, how can we make a better case for our defense in general and for NATO in particular on both sides of the Atlantic? I see three priorities. First, we must highlight the basic purpose of our defense to protect our peoples and our principles. Freedom, democracy, human rights, the rule of law. And everyone in the alliance shares these fundamental values. They are vital to our continued peace and prosperity. But they are not a given. We must all be prepared to stand up for these values. And if necessary, we must be prepared to fight to protect them. It was our determination to defend those values that ultimately ended the Cold War. 
former adversaries became allies. Europe is now at peace and people feel secure as war among European nations is simply unimaginable. Two decades ago, ago, we intervened to protect our values right here in Southeast Europe. And two years ago, we acted to protect civilians in Libya and enforced an historic resolution of the United Nations. Every single time we defended our values, every single time we acted to protect a way of life built upon those values, and every single time our values won. Protecting our values, this is the most important reason why defense matters. But secondly, we must also shift the argument from the cost of defense to the cost of no defense. Shift the argument from what we put in to what we get back. It's not easy for the public to see what we might lose if we don't invest in defense. So we need to do more to quantify this. And there are data available to help us make uh, the argument. For example, the 9-11 terrorist attacks led to a loss of about 1.7 trillion US dollars in stock market capitalization. The US Congressional Research Service has calculated that they also led to a loss of income and production of almost 300 billion US dollars and an increase in business expenses on security of 234 billion US dollars. Earlier this year, the World Bank estimated that the annual global impact of Somali piracy is a staggering 18 billion US dollars. The US Center for Naval Analysis has estimated that if the Strait of Hormuz were closed completely, oil prices could triple. Europol, the European Union's law enforcement agency, puts the annual value of corporations' losses from criminal cyber activity at one trillion US dollars. And you may remember that in April this year, a, a bogus tweet from the Associated Press Twitter account claiming that two explosions had shaken the White House led to an immediate loss of over 136 billion US dollars in traded stock. However, this financial cost is nothing compared to the human cost. In June, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees reported that there are now over 45 million forcibly displaced people. Nearly half of all refugees are children. They have become refugees because of conflict, crisis, and catastrophe. Ladies and gentlemen, these are just some examples of the cost of attacks, of the cost of insecurity, and the cost of no defense. I know it's difficult to calculate a total cost, but these examples illustrate that while there is a cost to be paid for defense, the cost of no defense is much higher. In today's unpredictable world, 
Defence is an essential insurance policy, so we have to spend money to save money and to save lives. Investment in defence is also an investment in one of the world's most innovative, highly skilled and highly productive industries. For example, in 2012, Europe's defence industry had a turnover of 96 billion euros, and it employed nearly one and a half million people directly and indirectly. The expertise of our defence industries has been built up over generations, and it has led to many products that have helped to transform our daily lives for the better, such as uh, the jet engine, satellite navigation, the internet, just to mention some examples. Like any other high-tech industry, the sector is constantly evolving. If we cut defense spending too much for too long, we will sacrifice that expertise and it will be impossible to replace in a hurry when we need it. Now, don't get me wrong, I would never argue that we should invest in defense just to create jobs. Of course not. My point is, we need defense to protect our populations and our principles, our values and our societies. And once we have a defense sector, we need to understand that it is not only a cost, there are also significant benefits including innovation and technological progress. Now, the third priority, if we are to make this case more convincingly, is to emphasize the wider importance of defense as a tool for international influence and cooperation. For all our nations, diplomacy has been and will remain the primary tool for dealing with international security challenges. But by investing in defense, we are able to back our words up with military strength and to increase our credibility. Personally, I believe that recent developments in the Syria crisis hold an important lesson in this regard I do believe that without the credible threat of military force, Syria wouldn't have agreed to the destruction of its stock uh, of chemical weapons. Ladies and gentlemen, these are three of the reasons why defense matters to individual nations. And they are three of the reasons why NATO matters too. NATO is a unique force multiplier and it helps allies to get an even better return on their defense investment. As part of the NATO team, 28 allies get more security than they could ever achieve on their own. <clears throat> they get friends to help them in time of need they get access to more military capabilities. They get a network of security partnerships with countries all over the globe. And they get to play a much larger international role. Whether in Kosovo, Libya or Afghanistan, capable military forces led by NATO have allowed us to put an end to violence and bloodshed to stand up for our values and interests, to strengthen the stability of these countries, <clears throat> and so to strengthen the security of our own nations. No individual nation would have been able to carry out any of these operations with the same success. Working together in NATO offers political credibility. It offers legitimacy, and it offers unrivaled military effectiveness. 
And this is why so many countries from around the globe have been keen to partner our alliance, including by participating in our operations and missions. Finally, working together in NATO has also helped us to strengthen another institution, the United Nations. Operating under an, a United Nations mandate, we have been able to provide highly effective and tightly controlled military forces that the United Nations would otherwise not have been able to provide. Uh, just last month, during the United Nations General Assembly, I met with Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, and one of the issues we discussed was how NATO could do more to support the United Nations, especially on humanitarian operations. So my message to you today is clear. If we want to continue to reap the benefits of defense, there is no alternative. We must continue to invest in defense. We must continue to invest in NATO politically, militarily, and financially. And we must continue to look for ways to share the transatlantic defense burden more fairly. The European Council meeting dedicated to security and defense at the end of the year and our own NATO summit next year will be ideal opportunities to take concrete action and to rebalance this burden. Ladies and gentlemen, defense matters. I know that. You know that. Your job is to help our publics know that too. As national parliamentarians, you have a special responsibility. You have to take the difficult decisions about defense budgets and about whether or not to send your armed forces into harm's way on operations. But you also have the responsibility to explain to your taxpayers why defense matters. You must frame the arguments and lead the debates. You must explain not just the true costs of defense, but also the real benefits of defense. Security is precious and freedom is priceless, but neither comes for free. We have to be able and willing to defend both. That's why defense matters. Thank you very much.